Hello and welcome to St. John Renfield Church here in Calvindale in the West End of Glasgow. It's Remembrance Sunday, but not as we know it. You'll see over my shoulders already the colours of the Boys Brigade, the 5th Company in Glasgow, and also of the Girl Guides. That will tell you that the Girl Guides leaders and the Boys Brigade uh, leaders have been in and already have presented colours. You'll see this very soon in the Act of Remembrance. I want to say that uh, for the Boys Brigade, it was the Watt family. And for the Girl Guides, it was the Wood family. So there was no violation of the requirements uh, under COVID, uh, just in case you were going to be asking. We will begin with an act of remembrance. Of course, again, that will be different this year and then progress through the steps and stages of the service as we, with gratitude, remember the sacrifice of those who fell defending their country in the First World War called the Great War, the Second World War and all the wars since. I wish to thank uh, the Boys Brigade for giving us our readers and also for the leader of the litany again this year. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you are facing, we draw strength from Jesus Christ and the power of God's Holy Spirit together, a company of remembrance and a company that recommits itself to seeking peace, the seeking of peace and the things that make for peace in this world. And now our call to worship. We gather in grateful remembrance of those who died in the defense of their country in time of war, the Great War, the Second World War and wars since, to recall the destructive effects of human violence, to voice sorrow for our own share in the world's violence, to confess our need for redemption and healing, and to recommit ourselves to the things that make for peace in this world. Let us worship God.
act of remembrance this Remembrance Sunday. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we shall not fear. We meet in the name of Christ, the Prince of Peace. Soon we will observe a two-minute silence as we remember those who gave their lives in the Great War, World War II, and wars since. We remember their courage, their devotion to duty, and their self-sacrifice. In particular, here, we will remember those whose names appear on the rolls of honour of the St. John's, the Renfield, and the Hindland congregations, whose union produced St. John's Renfield Church. As we remember their sacrifice, we call to mind those who currently serve in harm's way and their families. We are mindful of all those who, throughout the world, suffer the trauma and displacement of war and violent conflict. Remembering the war dead and war affected, we offer prayer for peace, not a fleeting or a shallow peace, but the peace of God come among us in Christ, a peace we are called to embody for the good of humankind and the earth we inhabit, which bears its own scars. I wish to thank all those who will participate in the service, members of the Boys Brigade, the Girl Guide, Cameron Murdoch on music. I wish to thank Sarah, who will put it all together, and my daughter Imogen, who's filming. Our collection will go to the Erskine Glasgow home. In silence, let us remember those who gave their lives for the sake of our lives, our freedoms, and our future.
They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. A wreath will now be laid by the Boys' Brigade under one of the war memorials in the sanctuary on behalf of the congregation. Christopher Watt will lay the wreath again this year. And now our call to prayer and opening prayer. Let us in honesty of heart seek the Lord's renewing grace to deepen our wisdom, to equip us as instruments of his peace. Let us pray. God of goodness and truth, we offer our broken hearts for your healing, our searching for your guiding light through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of light and love, you desire that all your people should live in your peace. Grant us the humility to seek your forgiveness and the will to practice it in our dealings with others. That our brokenness as people and nations and that of your world be healed. Help us in the days to come to seek the good of the world, to work for the increase of peace and justice, and to show tolerance and open-mindedness towards those whose character and customs differ from ours. Grant that our remembrance this day may be consecrated for practical service, and the world made better for our children and their children and all children. Receive our prayers for the well-being of all people, especially those who mourn and are sad, for all in distress, both known to us and unknown. Hear us for the peace of the world, for the wise resolution of conflicts, the release of oppressed people everywhere, and the renewal of your very creation. Grant that the people of the world may live in your spirit. And hear us as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord answer you when you are in trouble. May the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from his temple and give you aid from Mount Zion. May he accept all your offerings and be pleased with all your sacrifices. May he give you what you desire and make all your plans succeed. Then we will shout for joy over your victory and celebrate your triumph by praising our God. May the Lord answer all your requests. Now I know that the Lord gives victory to his chosen king. He answers him from his holy heaven and by his power gives him great victories. Some trust in their war chariots and others in their horses, but we trust in the power of the Lord our God. Such people will stumble and fall, but we will rise and stand firm. Give victory to the King, O Lord, and us when we call. I love you, just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy 
may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them. And you are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I heard from my father. You did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you to go bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This then is what I command you, love one another. Well, I often talk about my papa, my father's father, Robert Gillen, known as Bob. On Remembrance Sunday, kick it off with him, at least because it was from him I heard what stories of the war I ever heard. I was in my thirties before he told me anything. But as a boy, I used the kit bag that he brought his gear home in. Um, I used it for storing my hockey gear in, uh, not the skates, obviously, but the shin pads, the elbow pads, the shoulder pads, the pants, all that stuff. Uh, sorry, um, the hockey pads. Uh, and then I out, well, they outgrew the bag as my gear got heavier. But I still have that kit bag. And it's uh, something I can hold and look at and it brings back the stories, it brings back him and his war service. And then the fact he went back down a mine in Cape Breton when it was all over. He was a pioneer sergeant and ended the war company sergeant major. He was decorated by Queen Wilhelmina with a bronze cross for action taken at Delft Cell just toward the end of the war. His two older brothers, John and David, uh, fought in the Great War, the First World War. John was gassed and shot at the Third Battle of Ypres, Passchendaele, if you will. He was shot on the 30th of October, 1917. He made it home. David did not, killed in a riot in Wales, waiting for shipping home. I often heard him say, they call that the Great War, but there's nothing great about war, an old soldier speaking. Later on, when Papa was in his 90s and he lived to 97, living in a veteran's hospital, I went to see him. The Gulf War was on the war that followed in the wake of 9-11, the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers in New York, the Pentagon, and the one then that was defeated, the plane landing in a field in Pennsylvania. I'm sure you remember it all. Papa was watching the war uh, happen in front of his very, uh, very eyes uh, on a very large television screen. The U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had called it shock and awe, if you'll remember. And there it was, going off on the screen. And Papa said, there's a war on, Stuart, and it's no good either. And I'd be over there, too. Every year when Remembrance comes around, I think on those words. The, the complexity, the collection of things that were part of his life that collide in that sentence, that statement. Try to unpack it if you can. The assessment that that war, and for Papa all war, was no good, and his commitment, his continued commitment, even at that age, to fight for his country. Now he descended from Lanarkshire coal miners, and he might be seen to embody the human condition when it comes to war. He did not glorify it, took a dim view of it, did not foment it, but served his country with distinction when it came. It's an old story, of course, and many have been the voices that have sought to shift humankind from a war stance to a post-war stance where peace is sought 
where things are in need of being rebuilt, restored, regenerated. From the received wisdom that says violent conflict is inevitable in this world, and we must therefore prepare for victory over our enemies, to the received wisdom that says there are nonviolent ways to resolve our conflicts, and we must prepare for a just and sustainable peace. Many of these voices, recognizing the reality of violent conflict, but seeking nonviolent ways out of it, come to us from people of faith. Of course, extremists have sought to take over the ground of faith and turn it into yet another weapon in armed conflict. We've seen plenty of it in this century already. But extremist religionists have not had it all their way in this century or in centuries past. Psalm 20, a Psalm of David, comes to us from a time of conflict in Israel's history and is, on first reading, a communal petition to the Lord for the king's victory. May we shout for joy over your victory, says verse 5, and in the name of our God, set up our banners. The first part of the psalm prays that the king will be victorious in battle, and the second part gives an assurance that he will be successful. The king is called the Lord's anointed, whom the Lord will surely then help. The kings of Israel were anointed as such in the name of the Lord. It is messianic language. Thus bolstered, the psalm concludes in strong voice, almost demanding that the Lord give the required answer. Give victory to the king, O Lord. Answer us when we call. That said, the psalm resists any reading of it that seeks to militarize the faith of Israel. In verse 7 we read, some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. There is a requirement of Israel in this verse and of us all, that it does indeed draw its strength from the Lord, that it not look to military might, chariots and war horses as other nations do, but rather look to the Lord for deliverance and victory. We might agree that there is moreover an acknowledgement of vulnerability encoded in this verse, or at least of threat, of danger, of exposure. Other nations have horses, war horses, and chariots, and armaments, plenty of them, and yet the Lord is not asked to provide more chariots and war horses for Israel, for such a prayer would betray a bias to rely on the very things the psalm says other nations rely on but not ours. On this reading of the psalm, victory lies with God rather than superior military technology. We must acknowledge at the same time how difficult it is to rely on psalms and prayers in a world in which the term strategic weapons has for decades now encoded or coded for nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction. Other weapons, we say, are conventional. This language tells us a lot about ourselves. Yet do prayers and psalms still have their place, enabling us to envisage and find words for a world in which our higher faculties are mobilized to address conflict considering the basic human needs, rights, and dignity of all, valuing forms of power that are life-giving 
over those that are life-taking. The Gospel reading gives us the example of Jesus teaching his followers the demanding discipline of love. Love when loving becomes painful. Love when the cost is high. Love when love means sacrifice. In words that may be found on countless war stones and headstones in military cemeteries, Jesus said, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. It speaks of laying down one's life, not of one's life being taken. It is a major distinction. With regard to Jesus himself, we might ask, did he lay down his life or was it taken from him? The Gospels offer accounts of Jesus' arrest, beating, trial, and crucifixion in great detail, suggesting to us Jesus had his life taken from him by Roman soldiers on the order of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. At the same time, however, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says of his life, No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. This at chapter 10 and verse 18. Moreover, Jesus says he lays it down to take it up again, this in communion with his Father. His sacrifice is not a full stop, it leads to new life. It should not surprise us then that later in the same Gospel, Jesus teaches, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. How different this is from the cult of the blood-shedding hero, red not in their own blood, but in the blood of others, the cult of the strong man, the cult of the warlord. Jesus, whose blood is soon to be shed, stands opposed to this cult. We who follow him are called to the same disciplines of love and of peace. One way actively to take up the call to seek a just and sustainable peace in this world at this time, against the cult of the strong man and the cult of the warlord, is to work to revive and strengthen public discourse on the limitation of nuclear arms and nuclear testing strategizing reductions in strategic arms among nations. And this has immediate import in Scotland, as we know, with regard to Trident. The received wisdom of mutually assured destruction, mad, is an old received wisdom by now. It's had a good run, but is that the best we can do? It's certainly not the best we can pray for and work for. As the arrangements and accommodations that held sway in the latter half of the 20th century now come under threat from leaders who seem over enamored of the cult of the strong man, we must recommit ourselves to the strategic work of nuclear disarmament. I say strategic not only because of the obvious play on words with strategic weapons, but because I think the, wor the work itself will require that the many and arduous steps and stages of multilateral talks and agreements be entered into and sustained, and this through fractious times. This is not a dream of numpties. It is the mature goal of people who seek to weave the spiritual and strategic faculties and resources that are ours as homo sapiens, seekers of wisdom for ourselves and others, for our time and the time of our children and children's children and all children. The wisdom that says our differences do not make us enemies, rather they call us to seek victory together.
of life, in all times you have been present with your people. Bring near the day when war shall cease and poverty and pain shall end, that earth itself, habitat of life, may know your peace. Lord, hear our prayer. prayer. Yet is peace elusive. We remember those who gave their lives in the world wars of the 20th century and in war since, and all those whom we have known and loved, and who now dwell in the eternal peace of your presence. Lord, hear our prayer. Remember, Lord, those whose stories were unspoken and untold, whose minds were darkened and disturbed, whose bodies were disfigured, who suffered with few to hear. Lord, hear our prayer. We remember the courage and sacrifice of men and women of the armed forces today. We remember those whose bodies, minds and souls are scarred and whose lives will forever bear the wounds of trauma and war, of violence and loss. Lord, hear our prayer. We remember refugees, children whose lives are made desperate by violent struggles today. Lord, hear our prayer. We remember those who make and keep peace. Especially we give you thanks for those who enact just laws and work to create societies of peace and well-being. Lord, hear our prayer. May our remembrance be made with our eyes on the future. Let there be peace and let it begin with us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, home now. The only big bangs going off are the tail end ones from the uh, 5th of November, fireworks, the dogs not liking them, and all of that. You probably had the same thing in your own home with the Guy Fox business. But our minds have been on much bigger bangs. First and Second World War, we can hardly imagine. The generation has been dying out for some time that had the stories to tell. But of war, war we have known in our own time, and God forbid, but we may know it again. The thing is, what are we doing about it now, in a time of peace and freedom? Are we maximizing the opportunities that we have to work for peace, to seek peace and pursue it, as our faith calls us to do? And in this, we're going to need to have peace within ourselves and know that stillness that comes from seeking the stillness and peace of our Lord, who did not live in peaceable times, we might remind ourselves, and yet embodied it and taught it. Be in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guide and guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.